As His Holiness the Dalai Lama turned 85 this year, the Central Tibetan Administration, led by the 15th Kashak, dedicated the year 2020 as Year of Gratitude to His Holiness the Great 14th Dalai Lama. The Year of Gratitude is a celebration of the 85 glorious years that His Holiness the Dalai Lama has spent and continues to devote to the well-being of all sentient beings. It is an appreciation and collective expression of gratitude by the Tibetan people to highlight the outstanding contributions and achievements of His Holiness the Great 14th Dalai Lama. Despite the unforeseen challenges caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, the Kashak of the Central Tibetan Administration has organized programs and activities worldwide to celebrate the life and still unfolding legacy of His Holiness the Great 14th Dalai Lama. The Central Tibetan Administration's Department of Information and International Relations is organizing a week-long talk series on the four principal commitments of His Holiness the Great 14th Dalai Lama. Promotion of human values, promotion of religious harmony, preservation of Tibet's culture and environment, and revival of ancient Indian wisdom. These four commitments reflect His Holiness the Dalai Lama's lifelong conviction and effort to create a more peaceful, tolerant, and a rational world. The pre-recorded talk series will have 120 speakers from 19 different countries speaking in 15 different languages. It will feature addresses by heads of the various Tibetan religious traditions, followed by remarks and addresses by scholars, professors, monks, nuns, and other eminent personalities. The first panel of the talk series will be led by four keynote speakers. Geshe Thubdin Jimba, the co-founder and president of the Compassion Institute, the chair of Mind and Life Institute, founder of the Institute of Tibetan Classics, and an adjunct professor at the School of Religious Studies at McGill University. Geshe-la is also the principal English translator to His Holiness the Dalai Lama and has translated and edited numerous books by His Holiness. Geshe-la will speak on the first principal commitment of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, that is, promotion of human values. I am honored to be included in this special series um, celebrating the life and contributions of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, um, being hosted by the Central Tibetan Administration's Tibet TV. Um, and this talk series is really <clears throat> sort of uh, uh, highlighting um, among His Holiness's activities four main commitments that His Holiness talks about. Uh, one is uh, from you know, his perspective as a just another human being, you know, His Holiness's dedication and contribution to promotion of shared human values, particularly through a non-religious secular approach, universal approach. <clears throat> the second major commitment is promotion of understanding and you know, harmony across the world's current religious traditions. And this particular commitment is really coming from His Holiness's position as a major religious leader <clears throat> of our time. And then the third commitment is, of course, his historic responsibility of being the Dalai Lama you know, in whose shoulders rest really the, <clears throat> the survival and longevity of Tibet as a nation, Tibetans as a people, and Tibetan culture, and our Buddhist faith, as well as our language. And then finally, His Holiness's commitment is to really now uh, revive the appreciation and understanding of India's ancient knowledge. And this fourth commitment is really coming from his Holiness is a sense of gratitude for being the beneficiary of, uh, you know, over a thousand years of Tibet's Nalanda heritage. Um, the Tibetan tradition and Tibetan people have become historically the custodian of the Nalanda uh, heritage. <clears throat> and now that we are in exile, particularly the main community of Tibetans are in exile in India, um, His Holiness, the, through this commitment, in some sense, He's kind of repaying the great kindness of India's tradition to the Tibetan people, <clears throat> particularly with the recognition that, in fact, ancient India's knowledge, particularly those that pertain to the mind science, the science of human mind and emotions, is actually quite relevant in our time. So I've been asked to speak more specifically on the first commitment, uh, which is the promotion of human values. I've had the privilege to serve His Holiness for over 35 years now. In fact, I began 
almost 35 years ago, just over 35 years ago, in 1985, <clears throat> in October in Dharamsala. When I was in my 20s, I had the accidental privilege uh, to become His Holiness's principal English translator. And ever since I've had the privilege to accompany him in many different parts of the world um, and be present and serve him at the various public talks as well as conferences, teachings and so on. And over these many years, and in fact, before I had the privilege to serve his holiness, um, as a Tibetan, of course, uh, I always saw myself as a student of his holiness. And particularly at that time, I was a monastic member. And in fact, I received my full ordination of Gelong vows from his holiness directly. So and particularly as a monastic member, uh, he was a senior elder. He was our guru, he was our Vajra master. So there was clearly a very strong devotional and religious dimension in my relationship. But in 85, when I began to serve him, then of course there was a professional dimension in my relationship with him, serving him as his principal interpreter. And when I began, when I had this accidental privilege to become his principal translator, I started to read more carefully about his previous talks, his visits to particularly to North America. And, uh, and there was a beautiful coffee table book that was produced from his first two visits to uh, US. I would recommend a lot of people to actually get a chance to view it. It might be available in the libraries. And what was remarkable, you know, even in those early talks was the beginnings of already a very robust approach and philosophy of his bringing the message. And his holiness was absolutely clear, even in the 70s, that even though he's world's foremost Buddhist leader, when it comes to the larger world, he's not that interested in propagating Buddhism. He's more interested in digging into Buddhist tradition its teachings, its practices, its insights, its knowledge, and bringing it out from the Buddhist context and offering it to the larger world to be shared universally. For me as a Buddhist monk at the time, that was a remarkable, you know, a remarkable insight and remarkable kind of, in some sense, very courageous, you know, uh, act on his holiness's behalf. Because we see globally, Many great spiritual leaders. There are the, you know, there are the, there's the Pope, Archbishop of Canterbury. <clears throat> there are great Hindu, you know, spiritual teachers. But if you look at them, almost all of them, their first priority is to propagate their tradition, to look after the folk, as it were, members of their community, and then service to the world comes kind of last. With his holiness, it seems to be almost the opposite. You know, what he does with the Tibetan community, what he does with Tibetan Buddhism is relevant only to that community and that he will be continued to commit it. But when he's facing the world, when he's out there on the global stage, he is way more committed to bringing what can really help to all six billion human beings. At that time it was six billion, now we're in seven, over seven billion. And for me, that was a great sort of, you know, a revelation. We also, I also saw that already in the 70s, he was talking about the importance of meeting the challenges of a globalized world, how international travels, how global market economy, which does not, where the national boundaries no more no longer make much you know sense the, and particularly the environmental challenges which does not respect national boundaries you know which crosses boundaries if there is a pollution the air pollution is not going to stop when the border stops air pollution is not going to ask for passport check or passport control so it's a completely global phenomenon and his holiness was already talking about the need for developing uh, what he called a universal responsibility, a sense of universal responsibility. In fact, his holiness produced a small booklet called Global Responsibility. And he was already talking about the need for 
a shift in human consciousness. You know, the ability to think collectively as we as humanity and thinking about even the national issues in the context of global, you know, issues, environment, you know, world peace. In fact, some, you know, very few people actually appreciate this point. If you look at it, in 1989, when a Solonis was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, and I had the privilege to be at the you know, award ceremony, in the Nobel citation from the Nobel Committee, His Holiness was the first recipient of Nobel Peace Award whose citation include contribution to environment. So already we could see that the international community was appreciating His Holiness's contribution even to the promotion of environment. You know, he's, so we can see in his very early teachings, and then of course, as his stature and standing and audience grew internationally, his holiness was able to really, you know, seize on the moment and really develop this promotion of human values in a very robust way. Uh, I would urge anyone who's interested on this topic to really read two books by his holiness. One is Ethics for the New Millennium, which came out the year before the new millennium began. So it, the, it was published in 1999. And then the second one is the sequel, which is Beyond Religion, you know, Ethic for a Whole World. <clears throat> so these two books really articulate in very detailed and robust way His Holiness is thinking around this, con you know, promotion of human values. And in promoting human values, one of the things that His Holiness has done is to really work really hard to extract the discourse, the language, the conceptual framework, and the logic about human values, like compassion, kindness, you know, uh, good, good deeds, all of this, you know, morality language, out of the religious framework and move it at the level which is where it's more universal. And secular is the key term that is used, secular ethics. But secular here needs to be understood, not in the sense of opposition to religion, but secular in the sense of beyond religion, secular in the sense of universal, something that does not require a particular religious framework or religious doctrine or religious faith as a foundation. And how does he promote this? He uses three main sources for the development of this discourse on ethics without religion. One is to really call upon us to look deeply into our shared common human experience at the fundamental you know, reality of shared common human experience is the simple fact that not a single person wishes to suffer and every person wants happiness. This is a very fundamental reality of us. And in fact, we could argue that every drive in our life, some of which are good, some of which are not good, but every drive, you know, every activity that we engage in, at the underlying basis of this is really this fundamental aspiration to want to seek happiness and to avoid suffering. This is the fundamental reality. And also we know from our own personal experience, when someone does something bad to us, we don't like it. We are injured, we are harmed. And similarly, when we do something good to other people, other people benefit. So those are very shared common experiences in it doesn't really matter whether you are a religious believer or not a believer, believer of this religion or that religion, or from this ethnicity or that ethnicity, or you speaking this language or that language. None of this matters at this very fundamental human level. So His Holiness is one key source for the promotion is to ask us individually to dig deep into our own, it's almost like a self-exploration into our recognizing our experience as shared common experience. It's not something unique to us as individuals, it's something that is shared universally by every single human being. The second source that he uses is the common sense where you know each of us is gifted 
with a common sense to know what is good for us, what is bad, being bad for us. And also there is a shared experience that is part of it. And so using common sense is another uh, source. And finally, um, using the key scientific findings. And now there is a huge amount of science uh, connected with the research on happiness, on emotions, uh, right, and, and so on and so forth. And these new science is revealing how many of the qualities that we value as good qualities, like compassion, kindness, forgiveness, these are actually very good for us, not psychologically and emotionally alone, in fact, physically, with respect to heart you know, and health and blood pressure and all of this. So there is now a huge science known as the science of human well-being or science of happiness, which really constantly show how actually living ethically is the smart way to be happy. So His Holiness is using these scientific methods and scientific findings. So it is through these three he has been able to really develop a discourse. And, <clears throat> and this is important because historically, <clears throat> When it comes to advice on good living, you know, morality and ethics, societies everywhere, east, west, north, south, <clears throat> have generally relied on religion. Religious faith and religious beliefs have become the foundation from which we then promote, you know, ethics. In the Buddhist context, we talk about rebirth, karma, and how good deeds lead to better rebirth, how bad deeds lead to <clears throat> unfortunate rebirth, <clears throat> and so on and so forth. In the theistic religions like Christianity and Hinduism, there is a belief in God. So good and bad is the you know, uh, dictations, dictates of the almighty divinity. And to obey, the, you know, to violate those laws and norms uh, is a negative act. So how do we take thinking about morality, differentiating good and bad, and grounding ethics in a way that, has, that is independent of religious belief and religious faith and religious uh, doctrine? <clears throat> so this is one area where Solonis has really been remarkable. He has, in fact, initiated a whole new discourse a way of thinking about this, way of talking about this, and way of studying this that is now widely accepted in that mind. And central to this is really <clears throat> developing a robust discourse on compassion. Like ethics, compassion was also historically, you know, embedded in religious teachings. You know, we have great stories, for example, in Buddhism, we have stories about the Buddha's previous lives, Jatakas. In the Jataka tales, um, moral tales that talk about the importance of compassion and how Buddha acted in a compassionate way for the service of others. In Christianity, the whole image of Jesus on the cross is a story of compassion, how Jesus really took upon himself the suffering of the world. So, so we see in religious, you know, in teachings, compassion is at the core. But what His Holiness has done is to really say, yes, historically, religions have been the main avenues through which we have promoted compassion and kindness. But by themselves, compassion and kindness are not religious, you know, values. They are basic human values. And these are values that we inherit as part of our social nature, as social animals. And so in some ways, His Holiness is offering what scientists would call or philosophers would call a naturalized argument for ethics. And the point about naturalization or naturalism, as it is called, is to really look for foundations of ethics and morality in our biological nature as social creatures. And given that we are social creatures, which means that our happiness, our survival, our well-being is heavily dependent on the presence of other members of our community with us. 
And in fact, now there is a study that shows powerfully how even at the psychological level, our happiness is on a large extent a function of our relationship with others. And there's a powerful um, uh, study that came from Oxford. It's an ongoing study called, uh, it's not Oxford, Harvard, Harvard Adult Development Study. It's an ongoing study. It's a longitudinal, you know, thousands and thousands of people. There was a particular study done on men alone so that the gender will not complicate the results and the analysis. So is that for the studies, as much as possible, you need to keep the subject population as much as possible similar. So for this particular group, uh, it was done um, over a long period of time, several thousand men involved. And when they were in their 50s, these people, subjects were in their 50s, they were asked a whole series of questions. They were looking at their health status, socioeconomic status, relationship status, and, and so on and so forth. After 30 years, when they were in their 80s, the researchers went back to them, then examined several things. One is how many of them have survived and were alive? Among those who were alive, what level of happiness they were reporting? In all of this, what they were found, what they found was remarkable. Nothing beats the quality of relationships that you have in your life. You know, your health status does not beat it. Your socioeconomic status does not beat it. What matters is those who reported having satisfactory human relationships when they were in their 50s, they were the happiest. They, they were the longest living. So what the study, they, the, 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 the conclusion they arrived was when it comes to longevity, long life, as well as happiness, what matters most is the quality of the human relationships that you have in your life. And what is at the heart of that human relationship? Compassion, kindness. Without kindness, without love, without loving kindness, there cannot be any good quality of human relationship. So compassion and kindness is really at the heart of our experience of being happy, our experience of having a joy and fulfillment. This is what his holiness has done. His holiness is essentially what he has done is he has opened up a whole new field of compassion science. In 2016, Oxford University Press, in fact, published an entire volume entitled Handbook on Compassion Science. Without His Holiness's advocacy of more secular approach to compassion and ethics, something like this would have never happened. Today, not only the discourse on compassion has become secular and universal, in fact, compassion based training, compassion cultivation training, you know, I had the privilege to create one at Stanford University. It's an eight week secular compassion training, which is modeled on His Holiness's two books. You know, I had the privilege to produce one and this is now widely used. In fact, you know, a CCT based compassion cultivation based training. Um, there is an adaptation of it, which is being used in California for police. Training It is being used among healthcare physicians to deal with uh, burnout. It's now being you know, compassion training is also being used in education. So not only is the science of compassion flourishing, in fact, compassion training based on His Holiness's teachings and inspired by His Holiness's teaching is now being widely used in the healthcare sector, in other areas of our society as well. And this is what He's all, this is in the Tibetan, there's a saying that uh, the, the, the best water, a river stream, it should be traceable to a snowy mountain. And the authentic teachings of Buddhism should be traceable to the Buddha. Similarly here, when it comes to compassion science, when it comes to science of happiness, when it comes to now today's, you know, kind of growing popularity and dissemination of compassion based approaches, we can trace them to His Holiness's teaching, His Holiness's contribution. So among all the contributions that His Holiness has made, I think his promotion of secular ethics, his promotion of 
fundamental human values through an approach that is non-religious, that is independent of religious belief, that is grounded in a more universal discourse, um, tapping into shared common human experience and common sense and scientific findings is probably going to be one of the greatest. And as part of this, His Holiness has also promoted the fundamental concept of one is called the oneness of humanity. Um, sometimes in the West, we tend to also call it a, a common humanity or shared humanity. And the idea here is the really the, the simple fact that if we are able to relate to any person at the initial stage, at this fundamental level of human experience, where we bring the thought that just like me, this person in front of me wants to be happy, do not want suffering. So this concept of just like me is really this phrase itself captures the spirit of what his oneness is talking about when he talks about the oneness of seven billion human beings. And this is something, it's not esoteric. Basically what it requires is to turn inwards, look into ourselves, what makes us happy, what makes us suffer, and what makes us sad. Use this knowledge as a basis and from there to relate to, to other person at that fundamental shared reality. And at that level, it doesn't really matter whether you know the person in front of you, whether he speaks your language, whether he belongs to the same tribe, whether he shares the same religious belief, none of that matters. All of this becomes secondary. And His Holiness is telling us that we do have the ability to do this. We may have all the differences in the world, but if we bring our mind to it, we, each one of us has the ability to really get to this fundamental level of human experience and relate to the other person in front of us, at least at the first stage from that perspective of shared human, you know, humanity. And this is, and His Holiness also believes that this kind of thinking really needs to be brought out more widely because especially in this 21st century, in a very globalized world where many of the challenges that we are facing, particularly the environment challenge, the climate challenge, and the economic disparities, uh, conflicts, many of these challenges really have a truly global nature. And also, whether we like it or not, His Holiness, as His Holiness reminds us, we are living in such a globalized world where diversity and differences, perception of this is part of our everyday reality. We cannot expect ourselves to be now living in part of a world where everybody looks like us. Everybody shares the same religious belief. Everybody shares the speaks the same language. We are truly living in a multi-ethnic, multi-religious, multicultural, multilingual world. And in this world, what is required is the ability to go beyond the specificity of what defines us individually, but be connected, you know, of course, these differences are very important because it's, that's what defines us as individuals, members of a particular community. But these differences and identities should not obstruct our ability to really think more collectively as the big we, a big us, so that we can really, you know, relate to the challenges that we face in our time. Uh, it, so what is actually asking us, calling up on the world, is a fundamental change in consciousness transformation of consciousness. And his argument is that without that kind of transformation of consciousness, you know, living in this 21st century globalized world will be a real challenge. But in fact, we can take this opportunity and challenge as an opportunity to promote a different kind of perception of world, different kind of world where people care for each other, people care across their boundaries. And that in a sense is the central message his Holiness is teaching on secular ethics. So um, I would like to end with uh, a quote from His Holiness so that the listeners and viewers will have the ability to directly experience uh, His Holiness in his own work. So let me quote. And this is towards the end of his book called Towards a True Kinship of Faiths. 
I called here to all people, religious and unbelieving. I make this appeal. Always embrace the common humanity that lies at the heart of us all. Always affirm the oneness of our human family. Let your heart be softened by the balm of compassion, reflecting deeply upon the needs and aspirations of yourself and others. Let no differences from the view of others come in the way of the wish for their peace, happiness, and well-being. When we see another person, let us feel our basic affinity. In this place, there are no strangers. All are brothers and sisters in their journeys through life. End of quote. Our second keynote speaker is Kalun Kamagilik Yutok, the Minister for Department of Religion and Culture, Central Tibetan Administration. Kalun Kamagilik Yutok has been serving the Central Tibetan Administration for the last 34 years in various capacities as Secretary for Religion and Culture, Secretary for Education, Representative of His Holiness the Dalai Lama for Japan and East Asia, and as Cabinet Secretary. Kalunka Magele Yutogla will speak on the second commitment of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, that is promotion of religious harmony. Respected eminent speakers, dear sisters and brothers, Trashi Delik to you all. I'm very honored to be invited as one of the keynote speakers in English on the four commitments of His Holiness the Great 14th Dalai Lama of Tibet in the well-being of entire humanity and the globe. I would like to congratulate the Department of Information and International Relations, Central Tibetan Administration, on having organized this special talk series as an event dedicated to observe the year 2020 as the year of remembering the kindness of and expressing gratitude to His Holiness, the great 14th Dalai Lama. <clears throat> to remember the kindness of great leaders or masters and to remain earnestly grateful to them is not only a basic human character, but is also a common basic teaching of all major spiritual traditions of the world. According to Buddhist teachings in general and the Tibetan Buddhist tradition in particular, to remember the kindness of one's spiritual master and other fellow beings forms an essential ground for developing fundamental spiritual qualities of loving kindness, Maitriya, the great compassion, Mahakaruna, and the herd of enlightenment, Bodhicitta, which in turn collectively form the essential ground for attaining of the ultimate spiritual goal of full enlightenment or Buddhahood. Here it becomes necessary to point out what exactly it means to remember and repay the kindness of enlightened spiritual masters like His Holiness the Great 14 Dalai Lama, who his followers faithfully believe to be none other than the great Arya Avalokiteshvara in human form. Because of the extraordinary nature of being of the masters in question, the meaning of kindness and repayment of that kindness go far beyond our general concept. In fact, they are simply inconceivable. When any kindness goes beyond the worldly concept and notions in vastness as well as in purity, they remain truly inconceivable and unrepayable. It is for this reason we find instances like as follows in several standard Buddhist sources while talking about the kindness of perfect spiritual master, Guru or Kalyan Mitra, uh, quote, <clears throat> even if one fills the entire space of three realms of the world with the seven most precious jewels and offer it to him, that won't be sufficient to repay even a part of the kindness of the perfect masters, unquote. When we think about certain realities, in the realm of spiritual world, it is normal to come across several inconceivable phenomena. However, there exists a secret which is as good as repaying the kindness to a great extent. 
It is not any hidden or higher secret, but following the precious master's key instruction in word and deed with 100% faith and dedication. In other words, the best way to repay the kindness of great spiritual masters is not by offering material gifts or by writing volumes of books in their praise, but by making oneself a living example and medium of their noble teachings. <clears throat> Please bear with me for referring to some traditional sources here. No matter how they sound, I felt it necessary. In fact, one fundamental problem with the humankinds in general and the contemporary humankinds in particular has been their strong temperament to believe in and to run after all that is material and all that one can directly perceive. <coughs> Excuse me. His Holiness the Dalai Lama has said on more than one occasion that the best gift one could give to him would be to do good to oneself by being a warm-hearted person through practices of loving kindness, compassion and altruism. It may not be possible for any person in one lifetime to complete study and practice of all teachings given by His Holiness the Dalai Lama, but there is no need to take it a cause for worry and disappointment. There must be certain vital teachings which everyone can understand and engage in practice. Carefully understanding certain basic teachings and diligently engaging into their practice with unwavering faith and commitment shall lead to successful understanding and practice of other higher teachings. More than some 20 years ago, when His Holiness the Dalai Lama started talking about his semi-retirement from political and administrative leadership of the Tibetan people and the Central Tibetan administration, he also started talking publicly about his three principal personal commitments towards the well-being of the global community. The three commitments were to work on promotion of human values in his capacity as a member of the human community, to work on promotion of religious harmony in his capacity as a religious person and leader, and to work on protection of the Tibetan spiritual culture, language and environment. Some 10 years later, His Holiness added a fourth commitment and started talking about it widely and frequently. The fourth commitment was to work on the revival and promotion of the ancient Indian thoughts and traditions like that of the Nalanda Buddhist University. Thus, since lately we refer to these four commitments as the four commitments of His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama. It may be pointed out here that in fact His Holiness the Dalai Lama has spoken and worked tirelessly on the contents of what we now called his four commitments ever since his coming into exile and more widely since late 1970s. But until some 20 years ago, he has not called them as his personal commitments, mainly because of the reason that they were inseparable from the thoughts and efforts of his being the supreme political as well as spiritual head of the Tibetan people and the Central Tibetan Administration. The important point to be noted here remains that His Holiness the Dalai Lama has committed himself to continue his efforts in the four set areas even after handing over his political and administrative powers to the elected leadership. At this virtual talk series on the four commitments of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, I have been invited to speak on the second commitment, that is his commitment on promotion of religious harmony. Religious harmony in general is a very profound and vast subject and I do not intend to speak on it. As I understand, 
The very purpose of this talk series is to unfold, reveal and share the key aspects and contents of His Holiness the Dalai Lama's four commitments rather than to discuss the four subjects of his commitment in general. I would like to restrict my talk to some main thoughts and efforts of His Holiness the Dalai Lama on religious harmony according to my understanding and knowledge. Uh, first about the background situation. While we all know that all major religions have come into existence to solve problems and eliminate sufferings of the humankind, it has also been clear and apparent to us that several global, national and regional problems are based on religious issues. There have been earnest efforts from all religions and by many eminent religious figures and patrons towards resolving such problems through centuries and they did have positive impacts to a large extent. In spite of all the past efforts, the problems of religious disharmony still exist and often pose concerns in our time. It is in this context that His Holiness the Dalai Lama's commitment towards promoting religious harmony among the religions as well as among different traditions of the religion comes in. According to my best knowledge, some of the main aspects of His Holiness the Dalai Lama's commitment on promotion of religious harmony are as follows. Enhancement of mutual respect among religions. His Holiness the Dalai Lama sees the genuine mutual respect and understanding among different religions and religious traditions as the foundation of religious harmony at all levels. While forming and maintaining diplomatic type of formal relation and friendship among religions and religious traditions are praiseworthy and have been valuable, His Holiness the Dalai Lama's vision goes far beyond that label. Until and unless the respect and trust are based on a firm ground, it is unlikely for most people to develop real respect and trust for the other side. His Holiness therefore emphasizes on developing respect through contemplating on three principal grounds. First, the basic and core teaching of all the major world religions are same and identical. They include the teachings of love, kindness, compassion, tolerance, forgiveness, and all fundamental moral precepts. Two, all major religions benefit millions of people and fulfill their spiritual needs. Just as different medicines and treatments are necessary for different ailments and patients, different religions are necessary for people with different spiritual aptitudes and mental dispositions. Three, philosophical differences among religions should be seen as richness of the spiritual teaching as a whole. They are not to be seen as basis for conflicts and disharmony. There are several commonly understandable reasons for such differences. Firstly, there are certain natures or experiences which cannot be properly or fully expressed by words and perceived by conceptual thoughts. The source masters had no option but to express it in their own words and the followers took it in different meanings on the basis of how they grasped it and hence the differences. Secondly, the source master can deliberately teach the same subject, subject differently to different disciples or group of disciples on the basis of their spiritual aptitude and level of understanding. <clears throat> Gautama Buddha, the founder of Buddhism, is known to have followed this approach, thereby giving rise 
to the four Buddhist philosophical schools much later. Thirdly, just as one word can be interpreted into different meanings, different words can also be interpreted into one single meaning. So some differences can only be of the word and not of the meaning. Fourthly, if we are to go by the differences of philosophical thoughts, then such differences are there even within the sub-schools of the same religious tradition. Thus, the philosophical differences have no valid reason whatsoever to stand between the religions or religious traditions while forging inter-religious or inter-religious understanding and friendship. <coughs> Three, enhancement of uh, inter-religious understanding. In addition to the general ways to development and enhancement of inter-religious understanding through various inter-religious teachings, inter-religious gatherings and others, His Holiness the Dalai Lama regards the knowledge of basic tenets and teachings of other religions through proper study as the best and most reliable way to develop faith and understanding in other religions or religious traditions and strongly advises for it. This fundamental approach is even more strongly recommended for gaining proper understanding of one's own religion and tradition. In this context, I would like to give three examples of good success within the Tibetan religious community outside Tibet over the past six decades. One, when Tibetan religious masters, including His Holiness the Dalai Lama, first came into exile, Tibetan Buddhism was more seen and called as Lamaism than as any other proper Buddhist tradition. Gradually, the image as well as the name changed and regained its original name and status as a pure and complete tradition of the Nalanda Buddhist University. This change of image and recognition was a byproduct of the far-sighted vision of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, who directed with strong emphasis on intensive study programs as followed by the principal Tibetan monastic seats in the past. This direction was respectfully followed and implemented by all traditional religious schools and the difficult cause of preservation of the Tibetan spiritual heritage in diaspora became possible. Two, the other example was an important reform brought about under the direct guidance of His Holiness the Dalai Lama in the regular curricula of some historically esteemed monasteries and in all nunneries and subsidiary monasteries. It was none other than introduction of study programs in them on the main Buddhist subjects. This reform greatly helped in understanding one's own tradition and developing respect and understanding of other religions. Three, primarily <coughs> because of the global vision, no, sorry, uh, because of the noble vision and guidance of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and also because of similar guidance and efforts of the heads and leaders of the Tibetan religious traditions over the past six decades, I am confident to say with immense pleasure that the conditions of religious harmony, mutual understanding, mutual cooperation, unity and unity among and between the Tibetan religious traditions as we witness today outside Tibet is unprecedented in the entire history of Tibet since the 11th century. Four, inter-religious meeting, dialogue and exchange programs. His Holiness the Dalai Lama has always advised for inter-religious meetings, dialogues and exchange programs at different levels and has personally remained engaged in such programs for over four decades. 
One, His Holiness the Dalai Lama has always treated meeting with the leaders of other religions and holding interreligious dialogues as a priority in his regular as well as tour programs. Till date, His Holiness has hold hundreds of meeting and dialogues with eminent religious leaders and delegations from different religions including Christianity, Islam, Hindus, Judaism, Sikhism, Buddhism and many others. His noble efforts and dedication towards that end has borne many visible results. If I am to pick one most obvious reason, it would be the honor and recognition gained by the Buddhist teachings in general and the Tibetan Buddhist tradition in particular over the past few decades. Two, following early visits of His Holiness the Dalai Lama to the United States of America and Western Europe, the Council for Religious and Cultural Affairs of His Holiness the Dalai Lama was engaged in a highly innovative interreligious exchange program called East-West Dialogue, under which it acted as a co-sponsor in receiving delegations of Christian monastics from United USA and Europe to Tibetan monastic centers in India, and in sending out delegations of Tibetan Buddhist monastics from India to USA and Europe. The impacts and benefits of those exchange programs in developing mutual respect and understanding between Buddhism and Christianity has been significant and enormous. Three, it has been clear to all that, to all that interreligious gatherings like seminars and conferences have an important role to play in furthering the cause of religious harmony and interreligious understanding. However, the current status of this effort appears to be low at all levels, especially at the global and international level. For more than one obvious reason, the world religious leaders are unlikely to come up for such meets at the highest level. Thus, it remains up to the wisdom of the world leaders and the world organizations like the United Nations organization to see and decide whether or not the major world religions have anything to do with the present global problems. Six, importance of studying other religions. As said earlier, without basic knowledge of the teachings and tenets of other religions, it would be difficult to develop any genuine respect towards them. Being so, studying of basic teachings and tenets of other religions along with studying one's own religion becomes naturally important. This wise approach was followed in ancient time by major Buddhist monastic learning centers like the esteemed Nalanda Buddhist University in India. However, it must be said that the purpose of studying other religious traditions in those times was slightly different. It was mainly for defending the Buddhist traditions against non-Buddhist schools during philosophical debates prevalent those days. Such opposing factors and parties, in fact, were said to have strengthened the Buddhist standing and inadvertently, inadvertently contributed in understanding its own tradition more deeply and better. Thus, studying and understanding other religions, no matter for varied purposes, it is sure to be a win-win proposition. Seven, current world problems and religions. The fast advancement of science and material development over the past centuries, unfortunately, could neither eliminate nor minimize the human miseries. In fact, human problems appear to have grown 
not only in types but also in nature. An increasing number of current human problems has apparently no material solutions or remedies. They are sourced in human mind and ethics. It is here that the world religions are expected and morally bound to rise to the challenge. In the face of such a formidable common challenge, there is a huge extra reason for all the world religious traditions to come together and work in unison and harmony in the most crucial cause of the humankind in our time. To conclude, I would like to invite all to strongly wish and pray with me. May His Holiness the Great Fourteen Dalai Lama live for hundreds of eons. May all his sacred and noble wishes be fulfilled spontaneously. May his four noble commitments be accomplished fully and swiftly. And may we all be reliable medium of his noble visions and his four principal commitments. Thank you all very much. Our third keynote speaker is Geshe Lagdor, a Tibetan Buddhist scholar, director of Library of Tibetan Works and Archives in Dharamshala, India. Geshe Lagdor is also an English translator to His Holiness the Dalai Lama and has co-authored and translated several books on Tibetan Buddhism. Geshe Lagdor will speak on the third commitment of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, that is preservation of Tibet's culture and environment. So I am very pleased to be here to say something on Tibetan language and culture. This year, 2020, which is observed as the year of paying gratitude to His Holiness the Dalai Lama, which is organized by Central Tibetan Administration is not only befitting, but extremely important. And in this connection, <coughs> we have a number of programs out of which I'm pleased today to speak a little about Tibetan language and culture. I'm pleased to speak on Tibetan language and culture because for any people of any nation, you cannot think about a people and nation without language and without culture, which actually represents the very identity of that people and that nation. Long, long ago, people had hardly any culture, and Tibet, I think, is no exception. And also, we do not have any system of writing like any other people. But gradually, when language become more sophisticated and communication becomes more complex, and it's also not always <coughs> enough to just have the speaking communication, and people held, felt that we should be able to communicate in writing. So this is how language and writing came into being. In the case of language, even a child who reaches around two years old starts speaking. So therefore, at the very outset, I would like to mention that if you want to preserve your language and your culture, especially authentic kind of language, then you must take care of the language of their child, which has just started beginning speaking that particular language of that country or that nation. And that is the time when the initial and proper development of brain takes place. So that's a very important thing. I do not have to deal much, neither I have, nor, neither I have time nor it is necessary to go into length because when we talk about Tibetan language and culture, 
we are talking about such a huge subject which is difficult to do justice here. But we need to know clearly as I said right at the beginning and I would say this again laying great emphasis the greatness of any nation any country is determined in terms of the sophistication of its civilization and culture. Now when we talk about culture and in fact civilization civilization is a more deeper form of culture and normally civilization is recognized when that nation and country also has the art of writing and keeping the records and so forth. But whether you think about in terms of civilization or in terms of culture, both the word, the English word, culture and civilization has this wonderful meaning of culturing somebody or civilizing somebody. And in the beginning, as I said long, long ago, people were really like not cultured, not civilized. So people used to live like animals. So that time is gone in almost all the phases of the world. So there, but unfortunately in today's modern world, it really looks like that in the name of modernization, the very meaning of civilization and culture is forgotten. At least this is, if you see this in the context of the Tibetan culture and civilization, in the case of Tibetan culture and civilization, it is always focused on inner culture and inner civilization, not so much in terms of external material development. There is no denying the fact that we need material development. But the more you go outwards and the more you ignore the inner richness, the inner wealth, actually will become poorer as we are seeing today during this time of COVID-19 pandemics a clear indication that people are suffering is not only from shortage of material facilities but primarily due to internal poverty, unnecessary fear, unnecessary worry, not observing the disciplines that must be observed to protect yourself from the COVID. All this is there everywhere to see and as such the cases of the COVID-19 is instead of being able to control, it's multiplying, expanding exponentially. So all this clearly says, unless we observe the necessary discipline and culture and civilize our own mind, the solution will not come just from a vaccine. Even if there is a vaccine, <laughs> this vaccine may help reduce a little bit of the COVID-19 but I doubt it will be able to eradicate it because in the past also we had many other pandemics and horrible diseases like AIDS. AIDS is, in, for many of these diseases, honestly speaking, there is no proper vaccine. You can reduce it a little bit. There is some medication that helps a lot, but still there is AIDS, still there are so many other diseases and viruses and viral, you know, illnesses are still there. So all this clearly show about the need to have this inner culture, inner civilization. So in the case of Tibet, I'm extremely proud and happy to say that the Tibetan culture and civilization is extremely, extremely rich, which is normally expounded under the category of the 10 inner sciences primarily, Ringnenga or Ringnechu, the 10, the five major subjects of knowledge and five minor subjects of knowledge. 
But this 10 essentially includes almost every facet of human knowledge. I am laying emphasis on this fact because the Chinese government these days is saying that they made a lot of progress in Tibet. Before they came, all their knowledges are restricted only in the so-called 5 and 10 subjects. There are many others which they have to learn, which was not there. We introduced it. This is kind of, again, the, the usual Chinese tactic of showing their greatness without any reason, without any foundation. Because if you look at in detail with each of these 10 subjects, it really has the scope to expand and include. For example, within the realm of the Buddhist psychology or Buddhism, it can include, as His Holiness is doing, that we can have very rich dialogue with the scientists and incorporate within the Buddhist fold the scientific thinking, scientific findings, because this does not contradict the Buddhist philosophy, Buddhist science. And of course, no country is very well developed in science, in technology, in human knowledge right at the outset. It takes time. China was also not like this. It used to have different kind of knowledges, but now they are paying more attention to the material object and completely ignoring the inner richness of the Chinese civilization. And in the case of external material accumulation also, they are focusing primarily on making arms and uh, weapons to control others and kill others. So in the name of synthesization, the Chinese are actually, what the Chinese are actually trying to do is not even trying to change things in accordance with the good Chinese civilization and culture, but into the communist dictatorial way of bullying others, letting others follow what they dictate, so that few of the Chinese leaders like Xi Jinping can forever until they die, of course they are going to die, so that they are able to maintain their power and seat by any means. So that is their, unfortunately, their, their ultimate game, their ultimate thinking. But as a kind of rebuff to this, I really want to say that just by using the oppressive methods and resorting to the negative emotions and letting the negative emotions run wild, it is futile and useless to hope to achieve any long-lasting peace, harmony and happiness, which the Chinese is talking so much about. So in the case of the, the Tibetan civilization culture, as I said, not only me saying, but there are many Western thinkers who have clearly pointed out the inner jewel, the inner gem, the inner richness the Tibetans have accumulated for so many centuries is something that the human beings, the human world can benefit very much. And some, according to some of these scholars, they say the Western method of finding things is external, outside. It's just by, by going outside, exploring the atoms, exploring other material objects that they came with this sophisticated science and technology, which is good to some extent, provided if they are used properly. But unfortunately, the user, the human being, the human mind is wild, unruly, undisciplined, then all these powerful weapons and techno technology will be used in oppressing others, bullying others, as the Chinese government and many others are doing, which is unfortunate, very, very unfortunate. So therefore, at the end of the day, as for me, I have this trust and belief that the Tibetan culture really has a huge contribution to make to the rest of the world.
And I'm not just saying this. If you look at how many people, including top scientists, are showing interest about the Tibetan Buddhist philosophy and Buddhist science, as His Holiness calls it. So this rich Tibetan culture is based on Tibetan language, Tibetan script, Tibetan writing. Imagine a Tibetan society without Tibetan language. Imagine a Tibetan society without Tibetan script. I'm not here to teach grammar, so I'm not going to <laughs> explain in detail about how you know, the phonetics are used, how it should be pronounced. I'm not saying this, but I'm talking in general that imagine a Tibetan society, a Tibetan nation, a Tibetan people not being able to properly its own language, not being able to preserve its writing and the script. I'm saying this because unfortunately, Today, because of unfortunate situation that Tibetans are facing, I call it unfortunate situation because today we are passing through a very difficult period of the risk of total extinction of Tibetan culture. And when, when I look at many young Tibetans today, I've met many of them who are unable to speak proper Tibetan language. They are speaking, but it's all broken <laughs> or faulty. Then about writing, I mean, I'm not just saying it. You can do the experiment. How many Tibetan young, especially young Tibetans, are able to write Tibetan properly? Even here in the CTA, I must say this. Most of the communications are done in English because they feel very comfortable in writing English. Perfect or not perfect, I'm not saying that, but, but with the Tibetan, they have to think several times, how should I write? Where is the font? <laughs> very critical. So we have today passing through a very difficult time in terms of preserving our own unique identity. Unique identity is not that we have a special kind of nose or special kind of mouth or special kind of physical you know, structure, but unique identity in terms of this very special Tibetan culture, which is rooted in the Tibetan language and the script. So my hope and wish is that we not only observe such occasions, but come up with a strategy a proper plan so that we are able to sustain this unique Tibetan culture and unique Tibetan language. It is not enough for us to say that Tibetan is taught in all the schools. Yes, it is taught, but at the end of the day, when the, when the students finish their school, look at the standard. It's not enough that they are scoring some marks here and there, but really, this is an extremely, extremely serious matter. So therefore, if you leave, leave it just like that, then the Tibetan language and thereby Tibetan culture is going to gradually disappear. Just like the environmental destruction. The destruction that is happening in Tibetan culture and language is really like environmental destruction. In the case of environmental destruction, if one person fails a tree there, or pollute, pollutes the water down there, it is hardly noticeable. But when everyone starts doing that, and gradually you reach a state where replenishing and recovering the damage that has been done to the environment is irreparable, impossible to rectify. And this is much more dangerous, much more risky than the COVID-19, as many experts are saying today, that the extent of environmental destruction that we are doing today is so much that if we don't do something quickly and on a larger scale, a time will come when we have damaged the environment so much that nothing can be done. There is no, no scientist can come up with an injection, <laughs> a vaccine to recover the destroyed environment. 
So, Tibetan culture and language is like that. If we do not pay attention and work rigorously and work double hard, you know what I have noticed is like some, sometimes I feel a little bit dejected and sorry also that it hardly occurs to many people young or old that they are, they are, we are living in exile and our culture is facing threat, our language is facing threat and China is internationally dest destroying it in the name of Sinazization, things like that. So, there is this external threat, internal threat, Tibetans living in Tibet because of the circumstances, situation created by the Chinese. They are compelled to speak Chinese, write Chinese because this is how they can do better business and things like that. So, hardly anybody works or thinks for the long term preservation of Tibetan culture and language. So, majority of Tibetans are like that. Now, the smaller Tibetan community in exile, which is again <laughs> scattered all around just like bunch of beans, you know, scattered by a stick all around. So, we also tend to imitate that particular language. If you are able to speak English fluently, you, 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 you think you are somebody very special and uh, you go with pride. Similarly, German or any other language, you think you are quite individual expert. But what about your own language? What about your own culture? Who is going to preserve Tibetan language and culture? So, I am not really going to talk much. There are so many things to say, but not talk much. But what I am really saying is, now is the time not just to talk, but to come up with concrete long term plan to, to preserve this dying Tibetan culture and Tibetan language. I googled and tried to see whether the Tibetan language is counted as a dead language. <laughs> Fortunately, I, I found the Tibetan language is not a dead language. There are many. There are, I think, over 77,000 different languages, but half of these languages, they do not have a system of writing. So, writing already disappeared. I visited a number of republics in Russia, where they have lost completely their language and thereby their culture also. So, even in, in, in exile, in countries where there is a freedom, there are languages like English, which is so dominant, so overpowering that intentionally or unintentionally, you submit yourself to that language because of the so-called facilities, conveniences provided by it. So, it is because of this situation, internal and external situation, unless we come up with a plan and individually also people who have money, they should do something to preserve Tibetan language. The government also concretely do something to, to preserve this language and culture. Unless we take drastic steps, it is not going to, we are not going to sustain it. Right? So, that is my worry and my concern. Day before yesterday, I was reading a book, a piece on the situation of language, Tibetan language in, in Tibet. And some of these writers, they asked, or they, they did a lot of interviews with individual Tibetans, individual Chinese, and asked these individual Chinese who are living actually together with the Tibetan community, do you speak Tibetan? And the, almost all of them said, no, I do not speak Tibetan. Tibetan is so difficult to understand, so complex. The Tibetans themselves are saying mah, 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 something we do not understand. You know, they are making this really despising, sarcastic remark, you know, a language that is worthless to learn. Actually, that is what they are saying. And they are saying we also do not need this language. And instead, they said the Tibetans are not learning Chinese. But when Tibetans, individual Tibetans were interviewed, most of the Tibetans, they were speaking Chinese. 
which is in one sense good because they need it, but not the other sense because of the situation. You have to learn. But then what, what about your own language, your own culture? And if we do a comparative study, the, the state of language, for example, just in exile, the state of Tibetan language script before my generation in exile. How was their Tibetan language, Tibetan script, capacity to write Tibetan script? Then my generation, then the generation next to me is really worse and worse and worse. So there's my worry, there's my concern. But still, still there is hope. If we come up with really concerted, fresh effort, still there is hope because still there are a number of really good scholars, even among young people, who have really worked very hard and who have now achieved the state of a really, really, you know, a learned professor or learned teacher. So they have at least a good knowledge of the Tibetan script, Tibetan language, Tibetan grammar, and so forth. So now we need to produce the next batch of young Tibetans who can take that place. Few years back, I, as usual, I've been visiting many of these Russian republics. So there was one republic. When I was visiting, a group of people, senior people, came to me and said, Gishila, we have started a culture center. Can you please come? We just opened it just three days before. Please come. They want to preserve their language and their culture, their script writing. So I when they are very happily, but the script has already lost. So I was thinking, what are they going to do? In the case of Tibetan, still there are many foreigners who are learning Tibetan writing and speaking, but in those small places, nobody is showing much interest. So it's, it's, it's gone. It's gone. And when they opened the center, they wanted to write in their Tibetan, that their, their, their particular Republic's, you know, script. Three, four people came up with a different writing, and nobody has a, any idea what these writings mean. Just to write the title for that culture center. So that is the situation. So I'm afraid unless we take really, really rigorous, drastic step, we'll not be able to preserve our Tibetan culture and Tibetan language. And especially when we talk about Tibet, preserving Tibetan culture, number one, it is based on you know, language, and then script. Script means what is content in the conjured danger and so forth. People now nowadays, I don't know how many young people can read conjured danger and understand the meaning. <laughs> so they are just decorations on the wall. Despite his holiness repeatedly saying that that both the laymen and the monks should study. These are not just you know, decoration pieces to be kept in the shelves. So that is the situation. And then especially when we talk about Tibetan culture, as I said right in the beginning, it is an internal thing, the transformation of the person itself. So for the transformation of the person as a self, whether you call it through mind mindfulness, through meditation or through compassion, whatever you talk about, first you need to thoroughly know the subject matter, then appreciate that subject matter. Then make it part of your regular life. So that is not easy. It is easy to say nonviolence. But what do you mean by nonviolence? Why it is important? Why it is crucial? All this, unless you know, unless you have an in depth knowledge, will not be able to appreciate it. And if you don't appreciate it, there is no question of you are going to preserve it. So, therefore, I will end not with a pessimistic note, but optimistic note that we should really not only observe such occasions and just count and saying we did this, we did that. This is normal human way of doing things, which I am not saying useless, which is very good, but what is really, really important is to come up with a you know, proper plan 
so that we are able to preserve our Tibet, dying Tibetan culture and Tibetan language. Still, it is not too late. So, I am optimistic something positive will, will happen and to, to make this happen, not only the CTA, but different organizations, individuals, everybody has to have this fire in the heart by thinking what is happening in Tibet, what is our situation right now, what is the situation of our younger generation, what kind of value system are you going to give, what kind of culture that you are going to give. It's not enough just you give some beautiful clothes and some money you know, to the younger generation, no. A house to live, no. So therefore let us on this very important occasion of paying gratitude to His Holiness, let us make it a commitment, a resolution that in our own way we will do something to contribute to the preservation of Tibetan culture and language. Thank you. Our fourth keynote speaker for this panel is Geshe Ngawang Samten, Professor and Vice Chancellor of Central Institute of Higher Tibetan Studies in Sarnath Varanasi. Professor Geshe Ngawang Samten is a recipient of one of the India's highest civilian awards, Padma Shri, and Vesak Samman Prashasti Patra for his distinguished services in the field of education and literature and in recognition of his outstanding lifelong achievement in the fields of preservation, development, and promotion of Indian philosophy, arts, and culture within and outside India, as well as his lifelong services towards dissemination of Buddhist studies and establishment of academic institutions. Geshe-la will speak on the fourth principal commitment of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, revival of ancient Indian wisdom. Greetings to everybody. The central administration of uh, uh, Tibet or Tibetan central administration in Dharamsala is observing a whole year to pay, pay gratitude to His Holiness the Dalai Lama. So I have been asked to speak on the Nalanda tradition. So I will briefly uh, state uh, uh, some facts and uh, uh, realities about Nalanda tradition and its a system which is preserved in Tibetan uh, culture. At the outset, His Holiness Dalai Lama's uh, uh, kindness and the contribution that he has made to the life and people and country of Tibet cannot be narrated in words. Since his very tender age of 16, he took the charge of the entire country, facing tremendous challenges. Still, he faced the political challenges, the social challenges, the cultural challenges. And when China occupied Tibet, and which culminated uh, to the 30th, uh, the 10th March of uh, 1959, His Holiness uh, had to leave Tibet. So China's uh, occupation of Tibet was not simply occupation. The communist regime of China's occupation is not simply occupation of uh, the country in terms of uh, the political power, but uh, with a very systematic plan of uh, uh, erasing the very identity of Tibet, its culture, its identity, in all respect. So it, uh, after its occupation in the name of cultural revolution, it uh, uh, destroyed thousands of monasteries, temples, and uh, the learning centers, and the libraries, and the practice of uh, Buddhism and its uh, culture was banned in Tibet. So it was almost at the verge of uh, total destruction. However, since His Holiness came into exile in India, followed by a galaxy of masters, eminent scholars, 
and about uh, 70, 80,000 people, he started from scratch the restoration or continuation of a Tibetan culture by transplanting or by re-establishing those great monastic institutions and learning centers in India and having Tibetan communities uh, in a separate kind of places which helped a lot in the, for the preservation of our Tibetan culture and establishing schools for children separately apart from the Indian uh, school system which allowed these schools to provide education uh, to the Tibetan children in language, learning their culture and spirituality and religion, history and things like that which helped a lot in preserving the Tibetan culture. So, today to mention about the Nalanda tradition, which originated from Buddha's uh, teachings, we need to go back to Buddha's time. Buddha, after in attaining enlightenment in Bodhgaya, then came to Sarnath and uh, gave the first Dhamma sermon, uh, which is uh, known as the Dharma Sermon of first uh, the, the Dharma Sermon of uh, Four Noble Truths. The, there are two sets of causes and conditions. The first set is uh, the causes and condition pertaining to engagement in samsara, and uh, which is uh, the, the suffering and the origin of suffering, because. Uh, in order to understand the suffering, we need to explore what these, these sufferings are in reality, what kinds of sufferings are there. And if we realize that these are the sufferings of different levels, the gross suffering, the you know, subtle sufferings and the, uh, very subtle sufferings, uh, which can only be understood uh, uh, when one has access to spirituality and understanding of reality to uh, you know a uh, good extent then only one can understand that level of suffering once they understand the different levels of suffering then they both taught about the origin of these sufferings so where from these sufferings come from and uh, so the the sufferings come from our action which are induced by our afflictive mind, which again is based on our uh, misunderstanding of the reality and not being able to perceive the reality of the, you know, the, the world, the external world and the internal world. So, um, and uh, having understood this, to, you know, the, the causes and the conditions and the result the effect, the suffering, then we cannot just uh, get rid of these things uh, just simply by knowing these things. We Buddha taught about uh, the, 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 the two, another set of causes and conditions, uh, uh, which is the cessation, the truth of cessation and uh, the truth of path. The truth of cessation uh, Buddha tells in that uh, uh, teaching that uh, the causes and conditions and the suffering can be ceased because they are produced, they are composite phenomena and so therefore they can be ceased. But then all further he taught uh, uh, the truth of a path which uh, shows the path to come out of this uh, suffering and achieves cessation of suffering and its causes. So, in that uh, you know, great kind of uh, uh, explanation of uh, the path, a great detail of path, he shows uh, how to achieve the cessations. So, these two sets of uh, the, uh, the teachings, the pertaining to engagement in, in samsara and uh, pertaining to liberation from samsara, 
gives a complete idea about uh, the system of Buddhist spirituality and Buddhist philosophy, uh, which is a great uh, fundamental and uh, radical shift from the existing trend of spirituality and philosophy. That, that is why with the teachings of the Buddha that uh, uh, beginning with the, the teachings on Four Noble Truths, uh, he gave uh, uh, comprehensive teachings uh, you know, throughout his life. And uh, this first Dharma sermon laid down the infrastructural kind of uh, uh, framework uh, for the rest of the teachings. So this brought a revolutionary kind of uh, uh, revolution in Indian philosophical system and uh, you know, spiritual system. And also in his, uh, including the first Dharma sermon and in the remaining and uh, rest of the teachings, the Buddha emphasized on the four cardinal principles that every composite phenomena is uh, impermanent, which means that uh, we, by understanding that itself, can reduce to much of our suffering because uh, there is a big gap between our you know, common people's perception and the reality out there ontologically. So we normally uh, see the things as uh, you know permanent. Our relations, our, our relatives, our you know the external world and internal world. Uh, these mountains and houses have been there for you know decades and centuries and thousands of millennia, and then uh, there is a kind of uh, you know perception that uh, these are permanent. But uh, in reality, they, Buddha has said that uh, all composite phenomena are impermanent, uh, saying that uh, every composite uh, uh, momentarily you know, uh, changes. Now, even in the very small fraction of a second, it does not you know, stay. So therefore, at that time, it was not accepted by all of the, uh, the schools, all the other schools in India. And then there was a big, uh, you know, the exchange of thoughts and uh, there were critis critics from other schools uh, and things like that. And the second cardinal principle is uh, all contaminated things are suffering by nature. Here contaminated means uh, contamination itself is the afflictive mind. Whatever is afflictive mind, our hatred, afflictive minds that are hatred, anger, jealousy, ignorance and all these kinds of afflictive mind. Afflictive because uh, with the presence of this afflictive, mi afflictive mind and mental factors, they afflict us, right? They disturb us. So therefore, the afflictive mind and the related to afflictive mind and which are, you know, caused by afflictive mind, they are all suffering by nature. And then the next third one is the selflessness, that is uh, there is no such uh, kind of uh, independent and uh, you know uh, permanent uh, kind of uh, entity out there, uh, not only in terms of a person but also in terms of non-personal phenomena. So there is nothing such uh, independent uh, uh, existence. Uh, uh, you know, you know uh, which which stands out there without depending on its causes and conditions, on its past, and also uh, without depending on the uh, you know the uh, imp mental imposition and designation. So therefore, this this selflessness, the thought of selflessness, the concept of selflessness, was uh, introduced not only for the first time in you know in spiritual domain but also in philosophical domain at the global level we can say that uh, no philosophy no uh, intellectual system has uh, ever you know brought up this issue but uh, now in the later kind of scientific world uh, there are is a mention of quantum physics which also speaks a very similar kind of uh, concept of uh, the dissolution of things, if we pin down and explore and uh, then, uh, you know, the, when we uh, dissect them, then there is nothing uh, that stands, you know, our, uh, the, the examination and investigation, but they dissolve. So this is a, 
again similar to that, but uh, uh, the scientific uh, exploration is uh, uh, you know very much on the material world, but uh, in Buddhist, uh, Buddha uh, taught about uh, not only exploring the material world, but also the mental world. There is a great emphasis on the mental world. So, this uh, the the three uh, cardinal principles and the final one is the the nirvana is the peace which means that uh, once we are free from the afflictive mind and uh, once we are free from afflictive mind then there won't be any karma which won't result in any suffering so that state is the you know the state of cessation or the nirvana the, the, where there is no you know presence of afflictive mind which means it is at the state of a total peace so therefore these four cardinal principles uh, when buddha you know explained and presented uh, uh, to his uh, uh, disciples and followers and to the world that uh, really um, brought a paradigm shift in the philosophical systems and uh, consequently to spiritual system because buddhist uh, philosophy and uh, spirituality is uh, are very much uh, you know uh, interconnected uh, inextricably connected uh, not only buddhism but other spiritual systems in india because at the time of buddha there were many spiritual systems and philosophical views in in india which were quite rich you know but there has buddha has brought all these uh, fundamental kind of uh, uh, the, the views and uh, spiritual practices which are uh, very radically a radical departure from the uh, the existing kind of you know trend so the nalanda gradually the nalanda vikramashila takshishila odandapuri and those great uh, spiritual learning you know the learning centers uh, emerged uh, as a result of the rich Buddhist, uh, you know, Buddha's teachings based on that, there were lots of, you know, explorations, uh, interpretations are required uh, because the intellectual and the sp uh, philosophical content is so rich that that needs uh, further explanations and further in interpretations. And on the top of that, there used to be uh, lots of, uh, you know, critics from other schools uh, because in India there was a very strong intellectual kind of tradition of interacting interaction among the philosophical schools which i think is not seen in any part of the world in our human history but india had this uh, because of this uh, richness of interaction uh, buddhism played a predominant role in interacting with the rest of the indian philosophical schools so um, not only in the you know philosophical domain, but also in um, the epistemological you know systems and a lo system of logic and uh, in many other fields, uh, Nalanda scholars produced uh, you know the hundreds of thousands of uh, treatises uh, uh, exploring and analyzing the nature of uh, the you know reality and. Uh, in many other areas and domains as I mentioned earlier. So, uh, with, with these kind of uh, in exercises, uh, including interaction with the rest of this, you know, the schools, uh, Nalanda tradition played a very significant role in advancing the Indian system of philosophical system and uh, intellectual, you know, uh, system and, uh, and also consequently spiritual system we can say. Uh, this can be seen that uh, after the disappearance of Buddhism in, t in, in India, in the mainland of India, uh, you know, the entire kind of exercise of exchange and interaction got stagnated. That shows that uh, how much Buddhism played, uh, you know, a very significant role in the entire exercise of, uh, you know, interaction. So, uh, so this, the, the, these great monastic learning centers uh, uh, played, uh, you know, as I said earlier, a uh, very, very, um, you, you know, uh, important role in, uh, in, in advancing 
and the further development of uh, the Indian intellectual systems and philosophical systems and many other, not only to the spiritual and philosophical areas, but also in many other areas um, other than the spiritual and philosophical, uh, you know, uh, for example, which is not, which is very less known in the Buddhist uh, domain is uh, the metallurgy because Acharya Nagarjuna, Master Nagarjuna uh, is known for his uh, knowledge of metallurgy and even today if you visit the Nalanda uh, excavated uh, area then you can find uh, uh, some places where it is uh, said that uh, uh, the, 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 um, the experimentations and practices of uh, the um, metallurgies were you know uh, taken in those places so not only these uh, and also in cosmology and uh, in you know uh, the the uh, um, poetry and grammar and uh, arts and uh, uh, you know the medical science and uh, things like that it has uh, a, a huge domain of uh, you know the area and uh, one thing that uh, you know one should know that uh, uh, it was uh, the Nalanda and Vikramashila, these great monastic institutions, where the practice of uh, you know the, the, the where the trend of uh, uh, studying all the available disciplines uh, within one boundary got uh, you know started. And based on that, uh, it, it, uh, the practice went to Europe and, uh, and Western world and uh, that is how the concept of uh, the university and the nomenclature university uh, got uh, started uh, later in the rest of the world. So, um, then in Tibet, Buddhism was you know brought to Tibet by the great uh, the Dharma emperors, uh, uh, mainly the uh, Songsen Gambu, Tsung Tsen, and uh, Trila Rinpoche. These three great uh, well-known Dharma emperors, uh, they brought uh, you know the the uh, Buddhism to Tibet, uh, Buddhism and other Indian knowledge system to Tibet, and uh, a great decision. Uh, you know, many decisions, uh, great decisions were made. Among them, uh, I think the most important two are that uh, on the advice of the great master, uh, Shantarakshita Shivatsu, he, as he advised that uh, now the, 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 uh, the, all the literatures, Buddha's teachings and commentarial works of the Indian masters should be translated into Tibetan language so that uh, it, it can become you know, easily accessible to Tibetan people and, uh, and that was you know, uh, followed and uh, the translation centers were you know, established. And uh, then the second one is to establish uh, the monk spiritual community, the monk community which again with the help of that, uh, with the initiation of that uh, uh, kind of, you know, practice, uh, uh, the, this, you know, the great many uh, several monastic institutions uh, developed uh, in Tibet. So, um, as a result of this uh, idea of uh, translating and uh, educating the tibetan youngsters in um, in buddhism and uh, other you know fields related fields uh, uh, tibetan emperors sent uh, hundreds of uh, youngsters to to, to, to India uh, to study in many of those uh, uh, great monastic uh, institutions and uh, uh, and uh, hundreds of uh, Indian masters were also invited to Tibet. So that has not taken place in any other you know, countries where hundreds of the cream of the cream scholars were selected and then they were invited. And many of them uh, you know, uh, uh, remained in Tibet for the rest of their life and then wrote a number of uh, uh, you know, you know, books uh, uh, and uh, got them to, of course translated and some of them started writing in Tibetan also. Um, so, um, uh, 
And then the translation uh, took place, the, which as I said is a very historical e event and the translation also took you know, place, got initiated with a very systematic kind of plan. The texts were translated with, uh, you know, um, uh, the, the every trans, uh, the, the uh, translation of the text is uh, uh, undertaken in collaboration with uh, by a Tibetan translator in collaboration with the Indian master, so that there may not be any kind of a mistake on both sides in terms of you know the source language and the target language, and also later this is, was revised and edited and I think done went through a great many processes, and that is how Tibetan translation has become one of the best ever translation done in human history. So. In terms of uh, maintaining, while in the process of translation, the you know not only the literal, the thematic meanings were retained, but also the literal meanings were also retained, which makes the text so close to the original Sanskrit text that uh, the the root of the words, the suffix and pre prefixes also taken into account and a similar kind of coinage of the terms were done uh, so that uh, the complete sense, literal and thematic uh, meaning of the you know Sanskrit terms and uh, sentences could be retained in Tibetan language. So that is why we can say that uh, and, and even today it is uh, highly regarded and very much uh, known no, that uh, Tibetan translation is uh, uh, Tibetan translation and its uh, precision and the authenticity it has retained. So therefore, we can say in terms of uh, bringing back the textual bodies of the you know the texts, uh, the literature, uh, the work was done you know with the great you know effort and excellence. And this second uh, you know part is the transmission of the knowledge. The transmission of the knowledge related to those translated works are also done so systematically and authentically by bringing the you know the knowledge tradition from the Indian masters, uh, which originated from Buddha's time, and then you know with an uninterrupted uh, um, kind of uh, you know the the. Uh, a legacy or the transmission that uh, came to Tibet. So the second part is the transmission of the knowledge system. And then the most important thing which is the very purpose of uh, trans all this uh, intellectual exercise is the, the spiritual, the practice, realization. The realizational and the spiritual you know tradition and transmission is also you know uh, maintained and tra the transmission also came from uh, India. Uh, through those great masters, the spiritual, highly realized, uh, you know, spiritual masters and the great scholars uh, from India, which again came from the time of Buddha, and then that uh, this spiritual transmission and uh, the transmission of realization came to Tibet. So therefore, in three layers, I, I normally used to say that the, you know, the textual body of the you know literature or the liter literal body of the corporal body of the text and the uh, uh, transmission of the you know uh, transmission of the knowledge system and transmission of the spiritual and realizational kind of uh, you know the the system these all these three intactly came to tibet and uh, preserved for thousand more than thousand years right so this is uh, the you know special we can say a special feature or the the uniqueness of uh, the uh, Tibetan Buddhism, and uh, also the in the translation, uh, the, it is a huge corpus of you know the literature which is around to five thousand works, which cannot be seen in any other you know translation. Uh, the activity of translation you know, from one language to another language. So this is in terms of the number of works itself is uh, such a huge and then of course in precision and authenticity also it is you know it is uh, uh, a kind of you know a great work in human history. 
And then the, uh, the Tibetan masters, uh, uh, they started, you know, writing commentaries right from uh, 11th century onward. The huge number of commentarial works were, uh, you know, written by Tibetan scholars. I would like to give some example, just uh, some examples here that uh, by, you know, um, picking up some of the text, uh, like, for example, in the, uh, you know, domain of uh, the philosophy, I would, uh, you know, pick up uh, Umatsawa Shirab, which is Mool Mad uh, Madhimika Karika of uh, Master Nagarjuna, which is the, you know, root text of uh, the Madhimika philosophy, uh, the, the, um, the main, uh, the uh, treatise of uh, Madhimika philosophy. Uh, the translations that we have uh, in Tibetan, uh, written by Indian masters, numbers eight, whereas the Tibetan scholars have written 25 uh, commentaries. And uh, in terms of uh, the, uh, the entering into the middle path is uh, Uma Jugba, Madhimika Avatara. Uh, there are three commentaries and by the Indian masters and 60 commentaries by Tibetan masters. And uh, the um, the uh, Pramanavartik, uh, the uh, the text, a uh, very celebrated text of uh, um, the epistemology and logic by Master Chandrakirti. Uh, there are twelve commentaries uh, and about five hundred commentaries by uh, the Tibetan scholars. And uh, the Ngambadze uh, Abhidhamma Kosha, which uh, uh, you know, um, is written by um, Master Vasubandhu uh, related to the nature of mind, uh, cosmology and things like that. There are five uh, uh, commentaries and uh, 100 commentaries by uh, Tibetan uh, masters. And uh, the Vinaya, that is uh, the monastic, uh, you know, uh, the uh, contact, uh, code of conduct. Uh, there are five commentaries and uh, 50 commentaries by I Indian Tibetan scholars. And then not only with those uh, spiritual and, uh, you know, the philosophical texts, but also the Tibetan masters have uh, uh, our translations of, uh, you know, the grammatical, Sanskrit gra grammatical works in, uh, in Tibetan language. As uh, it is, uh, you know, um, in uh, the, the Kalava Vyakarana, uh, there are three commentaries by Indian masters and 25 commentaries by Tibetan masters. And uh, uh, Panini Vyakarana, one commentary and 40 commentaries by Tibetan masters. And um, for your kind information, there are, you know, some uh, the the Sanskrit grammatical texts uh, translated into Tibetan language, uh, which are not even known and heard these days in Indian uh, in India. Which one of them is uh, the Manjushri Vyakaran? I used to you know tell this to the Indian scholars and uh, the 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 audience uh, uh, sometimes that uh, the Tibetan you know. The, the uh, masters have translated, um, you know, many of those texts which are which got completely lost in in, in India, and to, in terms of the uh, the grammar, uh, you know, the grammatical text, uh, Manjushri uh, grammar is not known in India, and Chandra Vyakaran is, uh, you know, not only uh, translated but practiced and. Uh, uh, practiced in monastic institutions that is also not uh, it's uh, you know lately known but uh, the tradition is lost in india so there are many such things like that there are five six uh, grammatical tra you know traditions uh, which all reach to tibet now in terms of uh, the poetic works uh, uh, there is uh, um, kavya darsha uh, and uh, it has one commentary in uh, uh, by Indian master and 100 uh, commentaries by Tibetan masters. So this is just, uh, uh, you know, uh, a tip of the iceberg that I have just narrated here. So in order to let you know that uh, it's a huge number of, you know, works uh, written by Tibetan masters. And uh, not only commentarial works, there are so many independent works uh, written by Tibetan masters. So, uh, 
So we can say that uh, the rate of the you know the uh, the rate of the product of literature uh, in proportion to the population of Tibet uh, would be you know would be very high in comparison to other you know uh, countries and uh, nations. So and then not only the these uh, you know the tradition is preserved in Tibet uh, through. The, through education, through study, through you know scholarly works and intellectual exercises and spiritual practices, but also this uh, you know the Nananda tradition uh, is was advanced further by the Tibetan masters uh, by making significant contributions in the area of uh, philosophy, ep epistemology, and logic. I won't go into the details, but uh, just to mention a slide uh, to give you a feel that uh, in terms of the, you know, the, the uh, philosophical differences between Swatantrika and uh, school and uh, Dodeva school and the Vijnanvada school, there are very, uh, you know, n subtle nuances uh, that uh, the Tibetan masters have brought, uh, particularly um, Master Tsongkhapa, who brought uh, this, uh, you know, um, this uh, clarity. Uh, and also in terms of the philosophical, uh, you know, differences, uh, the very, very subtle uh, philosophical differences that he brought up with the clarity uh, is uh, the, the between Swatantrik Rangyuba uh, and the Prasangika Thengyuba, uh, Uma Thengyuba, this um, Prasangika Madhimika. So just to mention a very, very, you know, um, uh, 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 example, some of the examples, the Tibetan masters have brought uh, very, you know, made significant contribution to the advancement of the Nalanda tradition, which uh, I, you know, often think that even if uh, Nalanda uh, might not have, uh, you know, been destroyed in India or uh, disappeared in India, the Nalanda tradition would have gone in this very in this very direction. So, so, uh, so we can say that uh, not only you know survived but also advanced further this uh, uh, tradition by Tibetan masters. Uh, so, both the scholarship and the, you know, spiritual realizations, uh, you know, um, together, the, there is a saying that uh, all the valleys of Tibet, uh, you, you know, were filled with the mon monasteries and the, the caves on the, you know, the mountains are filled with the meditators and with the very, you know, highly realized uh, spiritual masters. And uh, the wave of these, uh, the, the practitioners and the scholars in the monasteries and in the caves, the waves and the ripples reached to the common people, which uh, brought uh, peace and uh, tranquility in the minds of uh, the people and uh, made the entire culture very peaceful. That is, uh, you know, um, you, how the the, it is that the spirituality and the knowledge system, uh, you know, did not remain uh, within the community of uh, spiritual uh, spirituality, but it went uh, per permeated into the social life, into the life of the common people, right? So it can be said that uh, the great, uh, so many great monastic institutions uh, got uh, flourished in Tibet uh, with a huge number, and as if the, uh, you know, the Nalanda monastic, Nalanda, Odandapuri, Vikramshils uh, got transplanted in Tibet, in terms of the the the, the intensity and height of the scholarships and realizations. And the number of the you know uh, the sanghas and the, the students and scholars uh, present in those monasteries, and then uh, in those great monasteries, uh, people from uh, different countries uh, came to study. Where from China, from Mongolia, uh, from Russia, and from of course from uh, you know the, the from Bhutan and from Nepal and uh, from uh, occasionally from Japan as well. And uh, so, uh, as a result of that, when they went back, then the Buddhism which came from Tibet and the Tibetan tradition went to these countries and uh, still we find the presence of the presence and the tradition of uh, these uh, tradition of uh, Buddhism in Tibet uh, you know still maintained 
in these regions. Um, so, as a consequence of uh, you know, the occupation of uh, uh, Tibet by the communist regime, then his holiness and uh, his, uh, you know, many of the masters uh, came to uh, exile. And uh, of course, this has been the, the darkest period uh, uh, of Tibet uh, in the history. But uh, uh, on the contrary, uh, this has proven to be a boon for Buddhism and Tibetan culture. And uh, so the Tibetan culture which remained uh, isolated uh, within the chains of the, the uh, you know, the, the snowy mountains, uh, once it came out then it became accessible to the rest of the world. And uh, then eventually it you know, came to be known as uh, Tibetan Buddhism, which earlier was uh, known as uh, mysterious and uh, uh, Lamaism or something like that. But uh, gradually when the scholars and students uh, studied and scholars came to know the content and the system of uh, the Buddhism, Buddhist tradition in Tibet and the profundity and uh, the, uh, the, 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 um, the depth of the study and uh, you know the whole tradition then gradually uh, people started accepting it as a, as a very spirit, you know serious uh, intellectual content and serious uh, spiritual kind of tradition it uh, the buddhism uh, uh, from the tibetan tradition uh, began to reach uh, to various uh, in many of the uh, universities, colleges, and sometimes even in the schools, and then of course uh, in among the uh, general public uh, through uh, many of those uh, the Dharma centers uh, uh, led by many of the spiritual masters, and um, so. Um, in general, there are three traditions of Buddhism uh, available uh, now uh, in this world. One is the Theravada tradition, which is exclusively based on the Pali tradition. The another is a Chinese Buddhism, known as Chinese Buddhism, which uh, is also based on the Sanskrit uh, uh, tradition, uh, which came from Nalanda, but uh, that uh, was not uh, as was done with the Tibet because by the Tibet because uh, the uh, tradition to China Buddhism to China went uh, uh, or brought to China by a very selected number of scholars and the uh, the transmission was uh, based on the choice of their interest and the number of texts translated were uh, around 1000 and uh, you know not much of the uh, philosophical and epistemological and logic texts were uh, taken to tibet uh, to china and studied over there but in now in according to tibetan tradition which is as we have discussed earlier is a comprehensive both in terms of the sutra and uh, and the tantra and the intellectual kind of system philosophical system epistemological logic system and uh, you know uh, the uh, strong spiritual tradition of practice so with these uh, the uh, the tibetan buddhism went to the rest of the world and uh, so, um, in the last uh, 30, 40 years of time, so many works were translated into primarily uh, in English and then into many other languages. Thousands of uh, works were, you know, uh, translated and uh, written and many researches are also, were also done. So, uh, with this, uh, you know, exercises, uh, uh, the the Buddhism Tibet uh, from Buddhist tradition from Tibet uh, became quite uh, known in the West, and uh, as I said earlier, it became known as a Tibetan um, Tibetan Buddhism, which is uh, mainly um, the tradition of Nalanda in a very comprehensive manner. And this tradition, and this tradition with uh, you know, uh, very. 
uh, with its in, in investigative and uh, analytical uh, approach uh, is found to be very similar with the uh, you know scientific system uh, and it uh, attracted uh, the attentions of the sci scientists, the philosophers and uh, other intellectuals of uh, other you know disciplines. So, His Holiness uh, uh, big, you know had been have been having uh, the dialogue with uh, the scientists uh, for the last uh, over 30 years and uh, you know very serious uh, dialogue as a result of which there have been very kind of uh, significant contribution in the you know neuroscience in clinical science in biology and psychology and uh, as a result of their research uh, so many great findings uh, uh, are you know um, the uh, done and found and um, with the collaboration of uh, the Tibetan the Buddhist uh, practitioners and the philosophers. So as a result of these uh, practices and the researches uh, many kind of uh, Im immense impact is found on the as I said earlier on the on, on the scientific fields. Uh, so um, the the uh, the the uh, because the Buddhist kind of you know the uh, psychological systems and uh, the uh, shows the the depth of uh, the uh, depth of the mind and mental system and how the nature of the mind the causes and conditions of the mind and uh, the you know how the negative emotions can be regulated and the positive emotions can be enhanced and uh, as a result how we can manage uh, a peaceful life and things like that so these are great in great detail with the depth not only in from the theoretical you know uh, the the presentation but also through with the practice these are the tradition is available in in you know Tibet and in Tibetan community so this with in the scientists have been exploring these areas and uh, have found uh, very you know um, uh, impressive results and these these results are published in the scientific journals and these are now being implemented in the schools and are also brought in the public domain which helps a lot in bringing peace to mind so, with the His Holiness's presence in India and the presence of the eminent masters and scholars and monasteries in India, uh, it has uh, you know made a significant impact in India. And uh, for example, the Indian border areas, which uh, uh, very selectively, very few you know students used to go to Tibet, but now the monastic institutions and the great eminent masters are available in India. So the large number of students can go to monasteries in South India and many other places, and uh, then uh, the visit of the uh, the eminent masters, uh, of course, uh, with His Holiness's you know visit in those places have uh, brought, you know made these areas as a vibrant places of practice uh, and uh, the you know the, the the teachings of the buddha so along with that his holiness uh, had a very strong vision of uh, bringing back the nalanda tradition uh, back you know bringing back nalanda's tradition or restoring the nalanda's tradition in india as a part of that central institute of higher tibetan studies right from 1980s have started a project of uh, restoring the lost sanskrit texts from tibetan sources and so far we have been able to uh, restore around 100 important treatises of the masters and uh, along with that uh, uh, His Holiness also emphasized that we should, to, we must uh, make effort to bring these texts into Hindi language to make them available not only to the the scholars and the scholarly community but also to the general public uh, domain. So Hindi translation has also been done, and uh, we have been doing uh, for the last many years, and uh, particularly in the recent uh, years uh, with the. Um, 
request of the Chief Minister of Bihar government, uh, Shri uh, Nidish Kumarji, uh, we have started a joint collaboration. The, on his request, uh, we have started uh, a joint collaboration program of translating the, uh, work, the teachings of the Buddha and the works of the Indian masters and the works of the Tibetan masters, uh, you know, translating them into uh, Hindi language. So this is a very, very ambitious and a mega project that might, uh, you know, uh, last for uh, several decades. Uh, uh, so we have already started the project. Uh, we have signed an, a memorandum of understanding in 2019 and uh, we have already started uh, working on this. Uh, our expectation is that uh, within um, a year and two, we will be able to, you know, uh, be able to uh, complete uh, not a major text, but uh, we have in the beginning selected uh, some of the texts uh, which are reachable, understandable to the common people. When they open the, you know, books, translations, they can understand that, oh, this is relevant to our life and uh, this is understandable. So we have not uh, picked up those very, uh, you know, the very uh, deep and uh, uh, challenging philosophical texts and uh, you know epistemological texts, but we have chosen some very uh, light texts so that uh, it can become uh, accessible to general people. So, with uh, the selection of uh, not large but uh, small size texts, we are expecting to get uh, translated about over a hundred of texts uh, within two years from now. So. Uh, then, of course, there is uh, the series of uh, the, the, the volumes of science and philosophy uh, initially uh, compiled in Tibetan language. Uh, a number of uh, you know uh, 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 series of uh, uh, volumes on science and philosophy of Buddhism. Uh, so uh, these are now being translated into so many other languages, and uh, with the, uh, these uh, you know making these texts, uh, uh, which are compiled uh, lately. Uh, with the instruction of uh, initiatives and instruction of His Holiness the Dalai Lama to bring before the world the science of Buddhism, the philosophy of Buddhism and uh, uh, the religion of Buddhism, making them three uh, separate kind of uh, domains and then presenting the science of Buddhism and philosophy of B Buddhism, which is uh, uh, as, as an academic kind of material to be brought uh, before the, you know, before the world. So I think this will provide a, a great opportunity to the readers and to those to the students uh, who are interested in you know knowing more about the Nalanda tradition. So Nalanda tradition is uh, uh, you know the Buddhism. It explores the inner world or the world of mind, just as uh, you know the 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 modern science explores about the material world and the external world. Similarly, they both have a similar kind of approach, analytical, investigative, in a very unbiased manner. So that is the re one of the main reasons that how Buddhism and uh, the science came together and they have been jointly doing such a great job in, you know, having interaction because of the nature of uh, having similar approach, uh, investigative approach, analytical approach. So in Buddhism, the inner world is, you know, explored to such an extent that such with such great details and the, you know, providing the system of, uh, you know, uh, 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 managing and regulating the mind and then showing the spiritual path how to advance further in terms of, you know, making oneself more peaceful by, you know, the, by, by working on one, one's own mind. And uh, in order to do that, we need to be educated on the nature of mind, how mind works, how mental factors work, and things like that, with the great details provided in the Buddhist account of mind. So, uh, I, I think at the end, I would like to, you know, um, appeal uh, to all of our, you know, uh, the listeners, and uh, particularly the Tibetan uh, youngsters and Tibetan community that uh, we must, uh, you know, uh, 
preserve this culture and the preservation of the culture is not just simply you know circumambulation and uh, you know postration and things like that of course these are also you know uh, of great benefits and uh, um, part of our tradition but uh, the actual essence of the you know uh, buddha's tra you know tradition buddha's doctrine is uh, to study to have the knowledge and then to internalize them and and through practice and uh, obtain attain realization unless we do not have these two things uh, club together the understanding intellectual understanding and to the spiritual realization the buddha doctrine cannot be completed so in within one individual person's life if you have a better understanding then you can do better your spiritual obtains better spiritual realization and make yourself more happier and uh, in order to do that we need to understand and study the you know the buddhist uh, system of uh, knowledge system of philosophy system of mind so that uh, we can practice and implement those things uh, through internalization and embodiment so this is uh, what i thought that i must appeal that uh, the buddhist uh, tradition is not uh, superficial it is extremely profound and uh, so therefore in order to uh, maintain and retain and preserve this tradition one must uh, study and then practice them internalize them otherwise it doesn't become a complete uh, you know um, uh, complete buddhism so um, with these uh, appeals uh, i once again um, pay my homage to his holiness the dalai lama for his uh, long life and uh, um, accomplishment of the wishes that he has wishes for the entire sentient beings thank you very much